Good evening, colleagues and, and uh, audience members. My name is Ed Reising. I'm the chairman of the Land Use and Transportation Committee for the Baltimore City Council. We are here this evening to conduct our fifth work session on City Council Bill 12-0152, which is Transform Baltimore Zoning. During the last session, uh, which was the fourth session, held on Thursday, February the 20th, we completed page 56 through line 7 of page 67. On today's, on today, we will start on line 8 of page 67. So if you turn to page 67, and we will start on line 8, which is 2-203 uh, transition rules. And we will um, we'll start with that. Uh, the Land Use and Transportation Committee intends to work progressively through the bill by reviewing it page by page, starting with Title I and continuing through the bill in order it is written. City agencies and public will be asked to participate by raising their questions or comments as the committee is discussing the page they have a comment or question regarding. I do encourage everyone to visit the City Council website www.baltimorecitycouncil.com to stay updated with the section of that bill the Land Use and Transportation Committee is working on at that session. Uh, in addition to the currently scheduled series of work sessions, the Land Use and Transportation Committee will likely hold additional hearings and work sessions. Uh, information about those will be distributed to the public as soon as dates, times, and topics are selected. Again, please check the Baltimore City Council's website for the most up-to-date information. If you are unable to attend the scheduled work session and you wish to provide written comments or amendments, please mail it to the Office of Council Service Attention to Antoine Banks, located at 1 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland, 21202. Or you can email, this is Antoine Banks right here to my left. You can email Antoine at antoine.banks at baltimorecity.gov. Um, we are, I want to acknowledge and introduce my colleagues to my far right as the Dean of the City Council, um, Councilwoman Ricky Spector. To her immediate left is Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. Thank you. To her immediate left, to my right, is Councilman Jim Craft, the Thank Vice you. Chair of the Land Use Committee. Thank you. Uh, to my far left is Councilwoman Sharon Green Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are also joined by Angela Gibson, representing Mayor Stephanie Roberts Blake. And I see um, in the back of the front is um, Mr. Andy Smalling, representing the Mayor Stephanie Roberts Blake. We are also joined by Kara Kunst, who is here representing uh, the President of the City Council, Bernard Jack Young. And also here, working with the City Council is our legal representative, Mr. John Wilkes. Um, I think that's it. So um, we are now on page 67, uh, line eight, transition rules. So we'll go on to that, we'll read that, go through that page, if anyone has any amendments. Chairman, I, you'll be pleased to know that I have only one amendment for Title um, Two, no, 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 but that's on page 66, and um, I just wanted to, it is on the handouts that you have received from my assistant, Stephanie Murdoch, and it is on lines um, 32 to 34. Thank you for your indulging me to go back a couple lines. And basically, um, it is an amendment to um, Section C, required conformance with landscape manual, and it just um, amends it. That 
following line to say, although a separate document, the landscape manual must be approved and amended by the mayor and city council to be enforced for compliance with this code. This is consistent with our conversations through um, Title I. Thank you. Thank you, Castle. Page 67. Anyone have any amendments or questions for issues on page 67? lines 29 through 37. Here's my um, question. This talks about pre-existing non-conforming use reclassified as permitted or conditional. And um, I'm not quite sure I understand what it says, but here's my question and why I'm asking it. Um, in my district, we have about, I think, seven um, uh, packaged goods liquor stores that are on the list to be phased out in two years uh, because they are non-conforming uses. Um, in my district, I have said that if a packaged goods store receives the endorsement um, of the local neighborhood association in writing to me, um, that I would rezone them uh, to C1 it, um, it, it, as part of this code. So, and actually I've submitted those um, amendments already for two in my district out of the seven. The rest are, uh, are, don't have that kind of support. So, what I'm asking is this. C1 is, um, the package goods stores are conditional uses in a C1, but I am assured that they will, they will be regarded as a permitted use once they're rezoned but I'm not really sure how that works, right. and I want to know what they have to go through. Well, uh, let's go. To, this is proposed uh, by the planning department, so you want to you want to give clarity to um, the clarity. Uh, as it says, any use that goes from non-conforming to conditional would be subject to conditional use standards. Um, and be permitted to stay, but if they were to expand, they'd be subject to the rules on expansion of conditional use, so it would have to go to the board to expand or um, make a substantial change. So it's not just taverns, it's any, any non-conforming use. Well, right? Yeah. <laughs> Title II has nothing to do with taverns, yeah, per se. Yeah. Well, no, this but is it the has rules to do of interpretation. And if you, one of your establishments is rezoned to C1 and that use, whatever that use is, goes from not permitted or non-conforming to conditional, then it's subject to, what this tells you is that it's subject to conditional use standards, which means it, it's, it can stay there, and if it expands, it has to follow the rules for expansion. Okay, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to go into the, the liquor piece, but it is. It has nothing to do with the liquor piece. Well, when it, it does, but like this has to do with the two establishments I'm talking about, and if we wait for everything, I'm afraid that we won't get to it. And so perhaps what I should do is rezone them C2 so they're not conditional uses because I'm afraid they're going to be made C1s and then all of a sudden they're going to have to go to the liquor board to get the right to be what they are. And that's why I'm asking this that's question nothing. now. It has nothing to do with that. They, they, they are legally established with their liquor license, and they would be legally established for their land use. It just happens to be a conditional use, which means that the use is essentially permitted as long as it meets certain conditions. There would be no inherent conditions applied because it already exists. It would be subject to everything for any expansion would have to go to the board or a substantial change would have to go to the board as a conditional use. 
So basically, they will not, and then I'll stop asking these questions, and the law department is sitting right there for when the day comes. They do not then have to get rezoned and then go to the zoning board to get their conditional use. No. That's what this says, is that if they go from the one status to permitted or conditional, they can stay there. They're well, yes, lawful, I, they become lawful in line 32, I believe it is lawful conditional use. Okay. Okay, but let me just say this forevermore. They are conditional uses without conditional use approval. And that's my understanding that they are conditional uses without needing to go get a conditional use. That can happen in any transition under a, a change in codes, and it could happen for any number of businesses, and that is essentially the purpose of these transition rules. Um, it, it has really, again, nothing to do with the liquor stores. You need rules to guide that transition because as a result of a mapping change or a text change, a use may go from not permitted or conditional, to conditional, to permitted, whatever, and that is the purpose of this section of Title II. It does not say here that they have to go back and get another use permit. Get, 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 get another, no. get, get approved as a conditional use. Just so the law department is sitting beside you, and this is to be now or forever. Chair, um, I'm glad that Ms. Uh, Councilman Clark, Clark brought that up because actually I marked those same, that's the same lines because I didn't have a clear understanding either and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we were talking. Is that good? Yeah, yeah that's better. Yeah. It doesn't seem like much, it's much better than my, my voice, but okay. Um, it, 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 I share the concern and it could be the concern on both sides. It could be this concern where, where you want someone to have a smooth sailing, or it could be concern on the other side where exactly. something you you some something is going to happen, and you're not sure where everybody's going to stand in the future. Um, with respect to Ms. Feinberg, planning will not be involved in this when it happens. The people who will be dealing with this will be everybody but planning. It will be zoning hearing exam, zoning administrator on the first floor. It'll be zoning board on the 14th floor. And everybody but planning will be involved. The neighborhoods will be involved in it. The property owners will be involved in it. And I wonder, it, it really isn't you know, clear to me how this is going to happen, how you go from a non-conforming use to a conditional use that hasn't had a conditional use hearing, hasn't had any conditions put on it. When it's a non-conforming use, one of the things we learned in the past couple of years is that a non-conforming use is basically frozen. It, it, can't, it can't be additionally, you can't put additional requirements on it. Um, you can't, it's a right by right situation. You cannot add conditions. We had a situation where the, someone tried to put hours conditions on, right. on a non-conforming use and it was struck down by the court. The hours could not be restricted. So somehow then you try to transition to the conditional use and it become, it's, it's unclear, I think it's gonna be unclear to us how this will be administered. I wonder if there could potentially be some some uh, language, maybe in the, in the next section or two, that will tell us how this is going to be administered. Who's going to make the determinations, for instance? We don't even have right now a good, clear uh, way of determining whether something's a non-conforming use or not. I mean, there, I've seen other jurisdictions they actually have non-conforming use registries. You can actually, you can actually have it on the books. Th these are non-conforming uses. These are valid non-conforming uses on the books right now. And you have to apply for that and you have to have that determination. We don't have that. We have sort of a catch as catch can thing. Um, and it, it's, it's quite chaotic and, and, and a mess. And this is gonna, obviously a transition is gonna make more chaos and more mess. So maybe what we need is some kind of, this is language that, that says things, but then we need a way to enforce or administer this language. That's what I, I'm, I'm, but I've got my answer and I'm counting on Victor to keep working at the law department. Okay. We're not going through this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,
page 68. Previously issued building permits. If a building permit for a structure was lawfully issued before the effective date of this code or any amendment to it, and if substantial construction has occurred within 180 days of the issuance of that permit, structure may be completed in accordance with the plans. Um, what constitutes substantial construction? Does that kick over to the building code or does that? You know, what is the definition of substantial construction? You know, Councilman, it's going to be loose. It's going to be in the eyes of whoever is enforcing this thing. What's what's substantial? So uh, there is no there is no tight standard here. Because what what we've had is, particularly when the market crashed, we had lots of projects that just stopped. And then they've sat there and nothing's ever happened with them. I mean, to this day, nothing's ever happened with them. Um, you know, the, um, I don't know whether it, if substantial construction has occurred within 180 days of the issuance of that permit, if someone went back and looked at that and said, I think it was substantially I think substantial construction had taken place, and it was four years ago um, that the work stopped, but the work had taken place within 180 days of the permit, then the structure could be completed in accordance with the, on the basis of which the building permit was issued, which could have been five and a half years ago. No, because that building permit will expire. So the, the reason 180 days is there is because that corresponds to building permits are 180 days. So even that would trigger the, the request for a new building permit, and then they would essentially start all over again. The point here is that they're not going to, the, the, again, the point of transition rules is to create some clarity for someone who's kind of stuck in the middle with their permits when you pass the new code. And the, as drafted, this bill gives a six-month effective date so that, again, it flushes out the system so that if somebody, if you sign, were to sign this bill into law, anything issued would What if it's just the extension of the existing permit? I don't believe that the housing department, and, and I don't think they're here to speak to that, but I don't think they just extend it if the yes, work yes, totally they, stopped. Oh, yeah, they do. All, oh, no, no, no they do it all the time. You have to speak to them on that. Yeah, they do it regularly. But this is written to say that it would have to get it would be under the new rules if there was a gap, in other words. One okay. example, I mean, I'm sorry, but I mean, let, let's use Harvard East, like so you, we just voted that in. So <laughs> what are you saying? If, there, if, there, if that's under construction, you're saying that after 180 days it stops for whatever reason, if it's environmental reasons or whatever, what, what happens? Is that, am I right? I'm not sure what you're concerned about here, but. What I'm concerned about is a plan is put in and that plan is the conditions change, ownership changes, whatever, people change, the roads change, whatever, and someone decides, well, I still want to build in accordance with that plan, which was approved four years ago, five years ago, six years ago. Um, and because substantial construction was done, permits get extended, there's really no new, quote unquote new permit, they operate under the original permit, they just get it extended. 
So no, it doesn't speak to permit extensions. That's, not that's what you issue. just said. You it's said what's issued under like what they can do under a permit that's issued, not. But if the permit were expired. extended and not a new permit was issued, then you could have a situation where you could have the a previously issued building permit where there had been arguably substantial construction done w within that first 180 days and then nothing could have been done for years and then picked back up under an extended permit. And my question is, should they be able to do that? Should they, shouldn't they have to come back in? You're saying should they be able to finish the project that they were originally issued a legal permit for? Well, they were issued a legal permit in 2000. Let's pick an example. They were in, issued a, a legal permit in 2009 for something. All of a sudden, there's no longer a road or there was a road planned and that road didn't happen or, you know, um, six other buildings have been built there around there since then and it changes the dynamic. I think I understand what you're talking about. I think that would be an issue with the building examiner to have different rules on extensions when a permit expires. I think that would be the only way to get to what you're talking about because it's not really a transition rule that is the issue. It's the issue of if, you know, four years lag, you want someone to sort of have to start over to make sure the circumstances haven't changed and the permit is still valid. So you would like, what I'm hearing you say is you want it to be a new permit after it expires rather than an extension. So it will be subject to all the new rules. Councilwoman Spector. Can I, can I bring a real situation that I'm dealing with? Because a permit never expires, it never expires. I have a building that five years is not complete. It's substantially there, but it's not finished. I don't know whether it's because of the economics, I don't know because of whatever the reason, it's still not ready for an occupancy permit. That's the key. It can't get an occupancy permit until it's completed. But these permits never expire. This guy's been going on for five years with an incomplete building. No, I think there's a big difference between substantial completion and occupancy permit. I think that, well, sub, I mean, substantial. They can't get an occupancy. No, I'm saying, but sub, the word is substantial construction. So the question is, if you build the frame, or if you put the foundation in, does that constitute substantial construction? Do you have to put the walls in to constitute substantial construction? Do you have to put the floors? You know, and again, it's That's my point. Who's looking the point at is, it. until it's ready for an occupancy permit, it, anything could be substantial. It's just not finished. But the, but the permit never expires. And the person, I With have all due respect, I really years. think this is a building code conversation and not a zoning code conversation because this rule is just intended to allow someone to finish what they started. That is all this is about. If your goal is to re-review, to, to allow permits to, to die and yeah. start over, that's not something the zoning code can do. I think that has to be in the building code. Well, you're saying it can continue, it can be completed in accordance with the plans on the basis of which the permit was issued. No, if you want the permit to expire and not extend a five-year-old permit, I think that has to happen somewhere else. This would not be the place for that to happen. Okay. All right. Where would it, if it's housing with the permit, yeah. it's got to go to HCD. Right. It would be in the permit shop in the, in the building code and the rules for, you know, once a permit expires, and they do work. expire every but, 180 days, yeah. but as the council said, they, they extend them. But the bottom line, bottom line is, 
you're going to let them operate under the plans as long as the building code, I mean, as long as the permit's there. Well, and also the, the language says on the issuance of the permit. So if you're getting 180 days of constru construction of the issuance of the permit, so if you've had construction four years ago and you've got an extension, you didn't do 180 days, you're five years back or whatever it is. So I think we can, if we can read it strictly, we're not going to get into the situation that you're talking about. So we're here joined by Councilman Warren Branch and also Councilman Bill Henry. No, it's got to go down. Just give it a mic. Just give it a mic. Yeah, here. No, I don't want to go. Thank you. Um, since we just talked about that, now I guess I would very much like us to talk about the, the bottom of the page, lines 36 through 39, because this is actually saying that all they really have to do is have an application in. Um, that's, it's, it's, an, it's another standard. We just talked about having construction. Now we're talking about an application. My, I have a lot of questions about what this section does. For instance, it's the application is considered complete. Who considers it complete? Where does that decision get made? Who makes it? Um, and I'm not finished. Um, it, it sounds as if this would require the city to issue a permit that will effectively reflect an earlier code. So the application comes in, somebody considers it complete, then the permit's gonna have to be issued pursuant to that application, which may be a year or so old. The other thing is I would, I would suggest that Ms. Feinberg may not be correct when she says this code is not the place because I brought, I brought with me the, a land use, the city part of the land use article and I was just looking at um, section 10301 where it says the Mayor and City Council may, reg may regulate construction under the zoning code. So I do think that there um, are things we do now under our code, and I think probably this sort of thing, now construction can definitely be regulated under the zoning code. It's the state, the state says so. Those are my thoughts. But I think we need to look at this last section and understand what is it really doing, and then who's gonna make this determination of this application is considered complete. I think when we get to Title III, it will be clearer because it outlines the, zoo, the duties and is very clear that the zoning administrator is the person that interprets anything in this zoning code and makes those determinations. So we agree it's a zoning administrator, okay. Councilman Craft? Um, I'm not sure whether this is um, ambiguous or whether I'm just not reading it right. If you look at the bottom of page 68 and then you look at the top of page 69, lines 37 to 39 and then lines 1, 2, and 3. So lines 37 to 39 says, an application that has been submitted and considered complete first, before the effective date of this code, or before any amendment to this code is governed by the code provisions in effect when the application was submitted. Then the next one says a new application submitted after the effective date of this code, or after any amendment to this code is governed by the code provisions. Um, so if it's submitted, when I read it out loud, I got it. Okay, Basically, I saw it. essentially what it's saying is, but essentially it's, what it's saying is that whatever rules <coughs> are in place on the day your application is completed are the rules you have to work under. And if there's a better way for the lawyers want to say it, that's fine, but that's the intent. Well, the thing is, if it's, 
Okay. That's fine. It, it is very typical to have rules for transition when you're writing new code, and that's what this section tries to do. And when I read it out loud. Well, when you read it out loud. We used a microphone would be in record. When, when you read it out loud, colleague, um, then I saw a, a problem. And I'd like to say exactly what the problem is in both sections. That the words, or any amendment. We amend here in the city council. We are engaged in um, establishing a comprehensive zoning code. But usually what we're involved in is amending portions of the code, for example, when we amended to prevent conversion to multi-use of R7s and R8s, two separate bills. Um, that was an amendment to the code. Now, what I'm seeing here, I, I see, I, I'm reading this, and what it says is, any application that has been submitted and considered complete before the effective date of this code, a comprehensive one, so far so good or of any amendment to this code, that any piece, amendment to this that, code? The purpose of that is to keep this as a living document. So if you were to adopt this code tomorrow, and then in six months from now, you have an amendment to it, you have to have point in time for the applicant. So if your amendment, if your amendment is let's say, pending in the city council, and your amendment would change a rule that would affect my potential application. Yeah, it's I basically know. saying that when I apply, I have to follow the law of that day, or if it is amended, then I have to follow that If law. that amendment is relevant to your situation, but that's not, what we, that's not what it says. It says any amendment, so that maybe we need to say any related amendment or something that says. Let's hear, before we go to the Capitol Inspector, let's hear from the if law I, department. I, mean, I, I just want to say one thing. We are looking, whatever we're calling it, this is a bill in the hopper. And so whatever now is law, timely, is what would apply. This, this will be changed probably four more times or amended four more times, but it's just a bill. It's not the code. We have a code that we have to abide by timely if something's introduced now until this does, in fact, become passed by the city council and signed by the mayor. Well, we I, think, I think what we need is some, I think what we're asking for is some kind of, with some clarity, right? We're looking for some clarity and understanding. Can you respond to what? Well, for one, if we have an application and we have an amendment that doesn't affect the application, I mean, it doesn't, you know, it, it, so it's, it, we're going to have the, 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 the law that was in effect at that time with the amendment. It doesn't matter. In other words, the, the amendment is irrelevant to the application. And so it's the law that was in place at the time that the application uh, was, was submitted. This is just a work in progress. It's, I'm sorry, are you, excuse me, so you're saying what, what are you saying, sir? <laughs> no, no, I don't understand. No, no, I'm and I'm trying to, to deal with it. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm trying. I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to be as articulate as possible. And, and Go ahead. Not succeeding, obviously. I got it. Let's. I'm just afraid. So, it's so let's. Inherit. So, let, if you have an application, well, I, I don't even. I, I don't even pull up an example. If you have an application that today you would be able to be approved. Right. All right. But you all amend the code somewhere, let's suppose the application deals with something in, section, in Article 5, let, let's suppose it's a PUD, and you have an application today, and the PUD would be able to be lawful if, if the application was approved. But you go back and amend something else, like you go back and amend, amend something like uh, a procedure that deals with, I don't know, rezoning maybe, some, something, something that's not related necessarily to, to a PUD, in which case your application is totally unaffected by that amendment. Correct. But that's not what this says. You that's say not that. what it says. It says any amendment. So that's not what maybe you mean. That's not what the language means. Uh, 
you well, we can, we can, we, if you want to put, if you want to put relevant in there, I think it would be unobjectionable. It would be unobjectionable. Okay, I'd like to do that. Relevance, something that's related to the application. Mr. Willis, you have anything you want to add to that, or is it already been taken care of? Oops, excuse me. That was a grand entrance for my first comment. I, th I think the law department has adequately dealt with that. And the specificity of another word I don't think changes. But it makes me happy. All right. Thank you. And what Thank was you. that word you mentioned? Both places, please. Um, Councilwoman, where, where do you want to put this? It's, it's, it is at uh, page 68, line 38. After the word ending. Relevant of amendment. And then. Fast woman, you got to use the microphone. And then on page 69, on line 2, you would insert before the word amendment the word relevant. So that basically it doesn't mean anybody can throw any amendment in to the code and you're stuck, you're stuck on an unrelated issue. Thank you. Is that, is that good? So yes, and it's okay with law, let's do it, thanks. So, that takes care of 68, we're still at 69. Um, anything else on page 69? Okay, that, that takes care of Title II, a purpose, applicability, short title. Now we are on page 70, which is Title III, outline of code administration, uh, subtitle one, purpose of title. I just want to reemphasize to my colleagues and to the general public that this is being taped, televised, and people are watching this on TV, and if we don't use the microphone, we'll talk just like with this, for instance, regards to this amendment. If we're not using the, the microphone, they're not gonna be able to pick up on the conversation of what's really happening. So, again, I strongly recommend, I don't know how to enforce it, but I strongly recommend that we use the microphone for the general public. Thank you. Um, Anything on page 70? I know we have some amendments. Um, oh. Councilwoman Clark? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure myself. Do, uh, do, we, have, do we have a microphone for Councilwoman Give me Clark? One second. She has. Oh, it's in backwards. I see, I see. Um, I'm sorry, everybody. My, my amendments, my amendments um, are reversed. If you'll just go to the back of that page. Thank you for your help. Um, Jesus. No. Yep, I got it wrong, I'm sorry. Um, amendment one, page 70, line um, 14. Um, the, and I would add the following language. The Office of Zoning Administrator is established as a division of the Baltimore City Department of Housing and Community Development. Just so, just so we have that straight. The, in other words, the Office of the Zoning Administrator, as now, is established as, um, as a division of the Baltimore City Department of Housing and Community Development. Such is the case today, such is the case that is working, I believe, and you've got all the experts on the building code, the zoning code, and everything in housing. And I think that's where it belongs, and I just want to make that clear. Thank you. No, I, I, I understand. I think Payne Department agrees with that, because if you read it, it's like, who, who oversees the zoning administration, right? To be honest, we weren't sure that it needed to be stated one way or the other, but we have no objection. Yeah, OK. That's why, that's why we're here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Still on page yeah, I'm seven. sorry. I got it. I finally found my own pages. I, I don't have anything else on this page. Uh, I'm here to help. Anyone else on page?
page 70, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It does not list, on this list, I do not see uh, that the zoning administrator makes a, makes a determination of nonconformance. Um, I would have expected to see. Line 19. Yeah. The zoning administrator right. administrators and enforces the code. That's the entire code. Yeah, on, page, on line 18 where it says powers and duties. Why don't need to that 19? Joan, you see that? I, I, was look, I was on the list of the following. I was on that list, but I didn't see determining nonconformance. Okay. That's what Question I just said. It's 18 and 19. Okay. There are the general powers, which, has the, which is on line 19, the zoning administrator administers and enforces this code, which is on line 19, which says, which means they enforce the entire code, and then there are some specific um, powers and duties under the code that are listed in addition to that. I'm not with you because I'm, that would be in one of the things that would be on the list, such as this, would be determining nonconformance. It's on page 7. I'm on page 70. I, I understand there's a, I don't, I don't know what our disagreement is. There's this list of many things, and I'm just saying that not, determining nonconformance isn't on them, and I don't understand why. That's all I'm saying. I don't why? think you could list every page of the code right. without repeating it. Again, I would argue that line 19 covers it. So why is, the, why is this list even here? Well, let's, let, let, let me ask the law, go back to the law department. To, to their opinion, this covers their responsibilities and duties, which is here, to, to answer her question. It does. I mean, the, the general language here covers everything, and then we have specific powers here, but nevertheless, they're subsumed in, in the general power. So the fact that you're not listing something specifically doesn't mean that necessarily he, doesn't, he or she doesn't enforce it. That's, that's the opinion of the law department. If anyone else has, uh, then that list is su superfluous, I guess, to the, to a certain extent. Councilman Curran, I mean, uh, Councilman Henry, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I I understand that I dressed down for the uh, for the meeting, but uh, he's the third district. I'm the fourth. Uh, we meet at Jerry's on occasion. Uh, I I. I I'm actually curious about another distinction between the general powers and the specific powers, and this is just a question. Um, does it matter that the general powers list only the zoning administrator, but the specific powers list says the zoning administrator or his or her designee? Is there, is there an important distinction to that? Uh, not in my mind there isn't, but... Uh... I, I can't see. I can't see the angle on it. And, and, and yeah. And it's, I, I mean, if, if if we were going to if we were going to change it, would it matter whether we added or his or her designee to the or subtracted it from the specific one? You know, if if you would subtract, I think it would make it. It would not make a difference. All right. Thank you very much, Chair. I just, I'd like to hear the opinion of our legal counsel. I, w I would concur with your interpretation of the law department on that. I think it's subsumed in there, but specificity, in my opinion, is always a good thing to do. The idea with, with, with being specific is that you clarify it for the, for the individual, that this is exactly what his duties are, but the duties right. actually are much broader. So it is something to, look, you can hold your nose to the fire here, but actually it's much broader. So I mean, that's, it's, just, it's just giving this individual some guidance, I think. Right. Thank you. Uh, page 71. Chair, I've got uh, something. It's a small one. We're looking for a little consistency. With this is uh, on line five. What page are you? Seven, Seventy-one. Okay, line 
five. Uh huh. And that it says that uh, it says. Um, to maintain permanent records of this code and all actions taken under it, including the rules and practices and procedures of the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. If you turn the page, we want a little consistency. Uh, if you look the, on page 72, on, pay, on line 6, the Board of Municipal Zoning Appeals may adopt rules and regulations. We're just, I just think it would probably be better if we said here on page 71, the, the uh, rules and regulations of the Board of Municipal Zoning Appeals as opposed to rules and practices and procedures. Councilwoman, Councilman Henry. Get there. <laughs> this is what I get for coming in late. The, uh, is there, I'm trying to understand why the zoning administrator is responsible for keeping the rules and practice and procedure of the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals and not the Executive Secretary of the Board. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Be before we go to that, are we all in agreement that that should say rules and regulations rather than oh, I'm sorry. rules of practice yeah. and procedure? Yeah, we're all, we're all good with that, okay. I'm sorry. But, uh, but whether they're rules of practice and procedure or rules and regulations, however the term of art that we decide to agree on for both places, wouldn't that duty be more appropriately assigned to the executive secretary of the board than to the zoning administrator? <laughs> we're not speaking of individuals, we're speaking of the office. Or the, not, not, and we're not speaking of the individual office, we're speaking of the, the position. I mean, just as something to consider. Because I'm, I'm picturing it from the perspective of the executive secretary of the board is the one who actually works with the board. It's not my understanding that the zoning administrator. <laughs> it, it, just, it just seems to me that the zoning administrator has oversight over the BMCA. No, no, I meant in terms of, they, they always refer back to the zoning administrator. They send it back. The director of the board. I'm trying to uh, accede to the is it, is, it, is it proper to say that the relationship is more the board decides what it's going to do, and then the zoning administrator makes sure it gets done? I mean, I, 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 don't, I, I, never, I never saw the relationship as it was the zoning administrator's job to take care of the board or watch out for them or oversee them in any fashion which I I'm have gonna, to, in, yeah, I, I, I can't I, picture that. Yeah, I'm going to. But to implement their decisions. I think that, I mean, they, they both work together, the, the, the administrator. But I, I want to put, put that on to the, uh, the law department, I mean, regards to that, your, your question. <laughs> Just, Thank you. It's the implementation. If you don't have the answer, we have to find it. We'll come back. I mean, go ahead. We have a comment. Care is just. Uh, pull up provisions of the charter that may answer your question, Councilman Henry. Uh, and that is that the board shall adopt rules for, this is in the charter, rules for the conduct of its proceedings, which may be, uh, rules shall be in writing and when adopted shall be immediately filed in the office of the board. So they're in the office of the board already. Um, <coughs> and shall be a public record. A copy thereof uh, shall also be filed with Department of Legislative Reference. So there are a couple places, adding them also to the zoning administrator, I think, facilitates you know, processing of things. The fact that they're in three places instead of just two is in the charter, to me, is nothing wrong with that and makes sense to me. I, so I, they're already with the board. See, I, see I, I would say it's one thing to have multiple places to publish something to, that's a benefit to the populace as a, as a whole. Multiple places responsible for being the repository for something, on the other hand, I would say might allow for confusion when different versions of something are repose in different places. I, I, that, so I hear, I, I hear what you're saying. I would say that the, you know, listening to the charter, and I would of course, 
you know, I'm, I'm, I will, of course, defer to the, 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 the legal reading of the charter, but a plain reading of the charter to me would say that the rules and regs for the board should stay with the board, and that would be why it should be the responsibility of the executive secretary, not the, frankly, the zoning administrator has enough trouble. <laughs> He's got enough stuff to worry about down on the first floor without worrying about the 14th floor stuff. So that was that was the only that was the only reason I was bringing it up. There's, there's, I mean, there, on page 71, there's line 25 going down to BMD. Does that does that help you out, Councilman Henry? In regards to some of your concerns or questions. Well, technically, the section there, if you go down to, what is this, line? Page 71, line Yeah, nine. line 9 and 10, where this, I mean, this appears to be just amplifying the language in the charter, uh, where the board is adopting its own rules and regs, and a copy of it must be filed with the Department of Legislative Reference. Copy, ah, here we go. Provide, they must provide the zoning administrator with copies of all matters acted upon, including orders, decisions, et cetera. Right, and then, and, but then we're, we're back to implementation. We're back to implementation there. And I, I totally understand and agree and appreciate that the zoning administrator is responsible for the implementation of the board's decision. I'm, but the, the only point I was raising was that the, internal stuff, the rules and regs of the board itself, how it operates for its own meetings, that should be the responsibility of the executive secretary of the board. I, I have, I've attended a couple of BMZA hearings in my life. The zoning administrator doesn't go to board meetings. The executive secretary goes to board meetings. They should be the person who would be responsible for the rules and regs. That's all. You know, I, I suppose if the if the rules and regs <clears throat> had uh, substantive value, in other words, it's just not procedural value. If it had, you know, so basically, how do how does the board read the code? The zoning administrator would want to know that. So to the extent that we're only dealing with procedures, I think that's absolutely a good point. We don't need to place it in there. But frankly, I don't know what the rules and regs say. I know there's not that many, frankly. Um, but if there's substance, he should have it. Then, again, there's, there's a difference between notification and responsibility. It's one, yes, you're right, if there's any substance in the rules and regs that is guiding the board's decisions, it would definitely be helpful for the zoning administrator to be aware of that. And so I would, I would hope that they would get a copy and they would keep a copy in their office, but there's a difference between them keeping a copy in their office in the way I keep a copy of the rules of the council in my desk because it's good for me to know it. I am not the legal repository of the rules of the city council. It's just helpful for me to do my job. Okay. Any, uh, 71, still on page 71. Mr. Wilkes, page that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, for the opportunity. I said this earlier, I brought tonight the uh, Baltimore City section of the land use article, and I have a copy in front of me. I think a few of you have copies. And when we're getting to talking about the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals, there's quite a, there are quite a few sections in the land use article about the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. And I don't see any reason why we wouldn't be referring to those in this next section. Um, we, we refer to the chart, right now it refers to the charter the way it's drafted, but it's not, I don't see the reference to the land use article, but there are quite a few sections of that article. It's, you know, 10403 um, uh, and, and the few after that. So, you know, they talk about what the board does, how it operates, all sorts of good stuff is in there. Why shouldn't we be, you know, using that, citing that, referring to that? That's a general comment that I have tonight. 
I think that, that makes a lot of sense, and let's, uh, we ought to put that in there. We'll say, and state law, something like, uh, in addition to the powers and duties specified in the city charter, blah, 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 and state law, the Board of Municipal Zoning. Okay. Joan? Okay. Oh, that would be line 28. Right. It would be line uh, 31, powers and duties, right? Line 31. We're on page 71, line, line 31, and I guess uh, after 89, we'd say, and state law, so in addition to the powers and duties specified in City Charter Article 7, sections 83 through 89, and state law, the Board of Municipal Zoning Field has a, follow has a following. I think you can just leave it at that because some of these powers are powers given by state law. So they're not, it, the wording wouldn't even make sense. Some of these things that are listed then are things that are given by state law. They're not in addition to give those given by state law. So I think if you want to be, you know, w when we make the reference, we're going to have to go through it and actually look at that and have the language make some sense. It's not just a simple matter of just inserting it. As long as, I mean, if the law department, the legal, the law department feels its legal sufficiency. I mean, Mr. Willis, do you agree with that? As long as it passes legal sufficiency, it's, it should be okay, right? Yeah, okay. and we can look for other places. You guys have a suggestion. Okay, you start. I was just saying we do have another suggestion further along where we're adding state law to, to the things that you're talking about. So, but it's, I think it's a great, it's a great catch. It needs to conform. Yes, it needs to conform. Councilman Henry. Thank you. Um, I had wondered whether or not we needed to add something to also clarify the powers of the board in its function as a board of municipal appeals, because we the, the list makes no reference to the fact that the BMZ also gets used to hear other matters. The one most 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 pressing to me being the late night commercial operations licensing appeals, the BMCA hears those, they're not in the zoning code. And so, and so this, was, this was how I was working through my head. So the reason we did not have to spell it out in here is because it's not actually, it, it, it's not actually dealing with the zoning code. It's not a land use. It's not a land use. So my question would be, since this already says to perform all other functions assigned to the board by this code, and it says, in addition to the powers and duties specified in the city charter, why would we have to add anything more? I mean, isn't that enough of a catch-all? Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm, 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 not, I'm not quite sure why we have to specifically add anything else in regards to their duties, considering we've already got, it's this, this list of powers and duties is literally bookended by two catch-alls. One is we got, you know, in addition to everything the charter says we can do at the top end, and at the bottom it's and anything else that it says we can do in the code. So is there, I mean, why would we add to the list? Councilwoman, back to book it. What, go ahead. When my colleague brought up the situation with the late night licenses, and they are applied for at the zoning administrators. The zoning board hears it. The zoning board hears it. So if it's the finance, uh, if you apply to the finance department and the community has a, p a window to register whether they support it or don't support it, it's been my experience in my community that they, when they oppose it, it's then sent to the zoning board, and because it is in their purview, then it's approved. It's just, it can't, it's not even a question. That's, that, are we repeating that kind of a problem here because of a, we passed the law that you had to apply for a license if you wanted to be open those hours. You have a, a mechanism that you go and you apply for it. 
the community has an opportunity to oppose it, the applicant just simply goes to the zoning board and they've not been turned down, not one case. Te te technically, the way the process works is that you apply to finance. If the community objects, then finance denies the license, at which, at which point the, the, the business owner has the recourse of appealing to the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. Right, and, but, and, but because this is, because late night commercial operations is not part of the zoning code, we don't have to spell it out in here, correct? Right, okay, but, but I, what I'm asking is why would we have to spell out any more than what's already spelled out? Well, that's why we go, this, this is why I'm going back, that's why we're having these work sessions because you, to get that clarity regards to these questions, because there's lay people out there, I mean, you're the attorneys, that's what we're going by, so do you feel, does, does the law department recommend that we add that to there, or is Councilman Henry has merit on what he's saying? Is it needed? Frankly, I think it's sufficient the way it's, it's drafted at the moment, but, um, you know, I, and, I can't, I can't. You're, I, just to be clear, are you talking about the and state law? What, what, what piece are you talking about? You are talking about and state law. That, that, that. I was just wondering why you would have to I think, say and state law when state law already supersedes the I zoning mean, code. It, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's absolutely true. No matter what happens, we're yeah. going to be implying state law. But, so, but, but for clarity, sometimes yeah. for clarity, we pop that stuff in there just to make sure that everybody's okay. aware. And I think you know we can we can tweak the language, but I you know we can put that we can we can tweak the language to accommodate what you're talking about, Ms. Floyd. But you know, um, it's a good, it's a good suggestion. I mean, I, I understand. I I myself agree that sometimes it may be to, to tweak it so when someone is reading it, they see that state law because you know we're all we're all not attorneys or or lawyers, okay. councilwoman inspectors. Would it be more specific to say Article 66B? They've changed that now, so now it's a land use code. Land use code. Yeah, so right. Unfortunately, we're all dealing with a different code, but same provisions. Any, anything else from page 71? Page 71. We are now on page 72. That's something that we bring to your attention. At the, this, is the law department. this is the law department. And uh, at the bottom of page 72 on line 31, uh, the Board of Municipal Zoning Appeals must give notice of the hearing to the parties in interest. Uh, we're suggesting that we delete the line because we don't know what parties of interest are. Or we could define and, and it. Would so what be, is, can you repeat, what is that now? You the, we, at the, on line 31 it says give notice to the, of, of the hearing to the parties in interest. Right. So we don't, uh, you know, the law department is unaware of what the parties of interest might be. I know we kicked it around and they could be all sorts of people. Uh, and we just don't know how to even define that. Although, you know, certainly we can make an attempt, but that's what the, that's what the context is. So you want to be more specific? The law department wants to be more specific? Or? We actually, we actually think you can delete it, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. Yes. Um, I, 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 I think I would like to reiterate my colleague's suggestion, which is, rather than removing the concept, it might be, it might be prudent just to invest a little time and energy in defining who the parties in interest are. I agree that it might be difficult right now, undefined, for the board to determine, well, who should we be notifying? But I, I think it would be, it would serve our purposes better to, um, to, to come up with a definition of parties and interest. I, I, I believe, uh, you know, can add to that. Thank, thank you, Councilman Henry. It's actually in the state code that the board shall give notice to the parties in interest. I hate to be repetitive, but this is why I bring this stuff up. It's right there in the state code. 
So it's already a duty under the under the state code. Now, um, I can. Does, it's, does the state define parties and interest? No, but I tell you what, I'm going to say something here. We're way behind other jurisdictions on this issue, because in other jurisdictions they they might use the term parties of record, but there are ways for people to sign up and become parties of interest or parties of record for things. And I'll give you an example. We we just had this example in our neighborhood where. Um, in my responsibility as a, a civic association president, I, was, uh, I had to write a letter to the zoning board executive director and said, we have an interest in this particular issue. We think it might come up. When it does, we want notice. I got a response saying you will receive notice. So we were basically making ourselves a party in interest and we were, we were told, yes, you will receive notice. Notice was not given. What we'll do is we're going to keep this open for discussion, okay? We tried. It didn't work, but we tried. But it is there in the state law. Does anyone need me to tell you which section it is? Okay. I'm good, thanks. Okay. So I, I believe you. Page 72, line, line 31, it's open for discussion in the future. Um, anything else on page 72? Page uh, 73. Page 73. Okay, since so we don't have anything on page 73, we're now on page 74, Councilwoman Clark. Yeah. Chairman, I have a couple of proposed amendments on this page. Um, page 74, lines 14 and 15. Um, B3. Uh, I, I, would, I would amend to read as follows. Among the powers and duties of the Planning Commission, to develop and recommend from time to time, city council revisions to the landscape manual, Title IV, Subtitle V. I'm just following through with my landscape manual being, if it's gonna be part of the, if people are gonna be held to, it's gotta be part of the code. That's all, so I'll be talking about that. Any questions? No. Anybody? Ms. Feinberg. Again, as I said at the last hearing, not taking a position on whether it should or shouldn't be part of the code, but I think it would be helpful for this committee to just make notes of where these pieces are and first discuss conceptually whether you have two things. You've got design standards, you've got landscape standards, whether you want them in the code, or as a manual, and then go back and figure out the various lines. Well, I think what we're doing is, we're, as we go through and we see these things, we're putting them in our discussion. If we um, decide that we don't want to do something, then when we get to these items, we don't need to deal with them. If we decide that we do want to do something, then we'll take them accordingly. Well, we can't have it both ways. They can't. We cannot, whatever we decide, we can't hold, we can't hold them as part of the code that they have to meet if they don't become codified with approval of the mayor and city council. Next, page 74, line 32. Um, well, let, me, let me do this. Before, before we um, go to the director of planning of the, the, the chairman had to um, leave for a community meeting. So, um, the, um, is there anything else in section 3203 with the planning commission? Anybody? Um, Councilman Henry. If we were going to add a requirement that the planning commission be responsible for re-examining the zoning code comprehensively every 10 years, would this be an appropriate place to put it? Because I had thought that we should do that um, 
starting in, say, 2025. Uh, and the reason I say starting in 2025 is because I thought it would be best if it be a 10-year cycle as far opposed from redistricting um, and the census as possible so as to not confuse the well, workloads. Well, rather, th yeah, be rather than talking about the length of time, let's talk about the place is first. This, yeah, is is this, that... Would this be an appropriate place to put it? I would think this would be an appropriate place, and just for the record, um, there was discussion um, in the drafting that the commission be asked one year from effective date to also do a report back, you know, based on, you know, that kind of first year to report back and to the council and um, maybe suggest any changes or tweaks. Um, so that may also want so, to So we're looking at like line, one year report and line 24 to insert some sort of language that would mandate a, um, I mean, I think Baltimore County does every four years or, or. They just look at their map, just for the record. They do not do the text. Um, I think Howard County does everything every five years, right? They do a, com I think Howard County does the entire thing every five years. But um, let's put at line uh, 24 on page 74 that we're going to look at. Um, language regarding um, review um, and review and reenactment or something like that for, for the sake of discussion right now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, anything else on Planning Commission? All right. Uh, next section, Councilwoman. Uh, yes, if, if you would go to page 74, line 32, powers and duties of the director of planning. Um, I would amend the sentence on page 32 to read as follows. This is one of the powers and duties. To perform the following reviews in sessions in which public notice is provided and public attendance permitted. And then this precedes a number of reviews, many, many of reviews, in which the planning commission or staff gets involved in developments. In other words, there's a bunch of reviews that follow. Um, site plan review. Councilwoman, well, keep that in front of you. Site plan review, excuse me, environmentally sensitive areas review, design review, landscape review, and among others. And so this is saying that for all those reviews, there should be public notice they're going to occur and the public should be admitted. Site plan review at this time does not permit the public to be present. I'm not even asking here that you get to say anything, but it's a public meeting <laughs> conducted in a public building by all public employees. Or, Mr. Chairman? Yes, can I admit? Ms. So Feinberg. I think but it's appropriate language. I'd like it to be considered. I think it's really overdue. Ms. Feinberg. Just a little background. Um, the currently site plan review has been an administrative function. It has is, is never um, been codified. It's really, frankly, for the convenience of the applicants to bring multiple city agencies together. In the drafting of this code, we very intentionally codified it, made it a committee with the full understanding that as a codified committee, it will be subject to Open Meetings Act under state law. We understand that. Um, we would have a great deal of objection to the councilwoman's amendment in this section for the director because the other reviews are our daily work and are often one person opening up a plan 
and looking to see, to make sure the new building doesn't go in the floodplain, for example. That would be the environmentally sensitive area. Um, it is not logistically, I mean, obviously our files are always open and the actions are always open, but it would not be logistically possible for the daily work of the department staff to well, I, be treated that way. Again, site plan no, review as a result of this code will be subject, but the other three, so the problem we have is putting that note here under the director and covering the other three well, would my, be a big problem. My interpretation, again, this is, um, you know, this is in our list of amendments, uh, but my interpretation specifically would allow for what you're saying because the powers and duties would say that the director of planning has the following powers and duties under it, to perform the following reviews the language says in sessions for which public notice is provided and public attendance permitted so if there were not sessions that were there was public per notice provided and public attendance permitted then the I'm not sure that's the councilwoman's intent it may not be the intent but i think that's what the language says well then is i'm that, not is that correct with that. if I'm, that's the if that's why you're are you asking me i wrote I, it i know but I know that I don't think that's your intent, or is it? I hear what you're saying that you could get two people in a room, and it wouldn't count. Let, let me just tell you what I intended. And I'm an English teacher, so this is a first draft, everybody. Um, I, we always make it better, at least here. But I. I think it's ironic that we're having a discussion. We can fix the language so it says what we all could understand. But site plan review makes a difference to development. I don't care. You can't even sit and watch it happen. And basically, when people come out of it, they come back to our neighborhood meetings and say, well, I've been through site plan review and everything seems to be just fine. Well. How do I know whether it was fine? How does anyone know? What was it? Who said what? What is it? And so, secondly, my, 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 we're worried about design review and landscape review having public notice and letting public people come. And, and yet, we're realizing that we probably may, need to make these public documents that are publicly approved and, and amended if they're going to be, if people are going to be held to honoring them. And if that's the case, then just like site plan review becoming a formal committee, then they, they're subject to the open, uh, uh, the open session and meeting law. That's a problem that's got to be solved here, is all these things that happen that we don't know how happening, including me, and all of a sudden they've happened and they mean something and it's your district, it's your neighborhood, you don't know. Now, I don't have the faintest idea what an environmentally sensitive areas review is. So I am in no position to discuss that and I don't think I've got one in my district unless it's right after, you know, the blizzard. Um, but those three need to be a public notice and they need to be um, open to the public to at least observe. And I can fix the language, but I would like this council to make that happen. So we are not constantly being surprised um, by what happened and developers come to our meetings and tell us in front of our constituents. And we don't know. I think, yeah, and I think we all understand what you, what you mean there. Um, but I agree with you with regard to site plan review, um, particularly on things like, simple things like curb cuts and stuff like that. Um, I mean, I'll come home and somebody will have a, open, they'll have a garage, they'll have a curb cut, and they'll have a sign that says, you know, park here and I'll tow your ass away. Um, 
you know, and then they're trying to tow off the public street, which they have no right to do, but they're out there trying to do it. And no one knows that, no one knows they've applied, no one knows they've been there, no one knows they've been granted permission until all of a sudden it's there. And then everybody's saying, where did those parking spaces go? And why is that sign up there? And whatever, so. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because the curb cut policy is something, again, that's been sort of a, a policy amongst the agencies, but in this text, it becomes the law. So, and then subject to that. So I think we, we heard that loud and clear and really tighten that up. And again, as drafted, our understanding is the site plan review committee would become subject to open meetings, but um, the other actions are, are our standard daily work. Can you can you answer the councilwoman's question question about environmentally sensitive areas review? Is what the is building that? we get a permit for something that's in a floodplain or in a floodway, and we have to review the plan, make sure it's elevated, um, make sure the you know the water's flowing and it's designed in a proper manner. Uh, the design review would be for the standards, again, if they stay in the code, as the, the council suggested, and it says that, you know, the, the, if the block's mostly red brick, the building's got to be red brick. The, the design review, according to that, would be a staff architect looking at the plan and saying, if the code says red brick, yep, drawings say red brick. Yes, that's what that would be. So right. um, those would be essentially the functions that the staff has to do on a day-to-day -day basis. There are, these are the pieces of this code that are, again, under the director of planning. 99% is the zoning administrator, but he doesn't do the, the environmentally sensitive review, the design review, and the landscape review. Let, let me just Council say this, if I may. Uh, if you want, if planning wants design review and landscape review to be part of this code that people have to, must obey, then meetings in which this, these are discussed must be public and there should be notice. I know if one person is talking to one developer in a hallway, that's not a meeting. But if you've got a meeting where you're discussing something that that developer is going to come back to my community and say, well, I passed design review. Where did you have design review? When did that happen? Oh, I, my landscaping plan is fine. I've been to landscape review. Guess what? That, I don't care if it's one person talking to 10 people, I don't care. Those are called reviews, they are official, they need to be open to the people that care about them because decisions are made there that cannot be reversed. And unless you don't want this to be part of the code. In other words, we do site plan review and the rest of it's just advisory in nature and they don't have to do it to get their permit, fine. But site plan review makes a difference they, those people never come back together again to give their advice, et cetera, to that developer. They just don't keep meeting with the same person. That, that's important, and it's up to planning what they want. You want design review and landscape review that's advisory in nature, except for laws pertaining, then fine. But if you want it to be codified or subject that you have to, well, this must be obeyed, then you gotta open this to the public. Period, the end. It matters. All right, um, anything else on page 74? Page 74, Ms. Floyd. Thanks, I think someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that anyone who has a stream running through uh, their neighborhood or their district has an environmentally sensitive area in their district. And I know, I don't know how much this code is getting into that, but this is an area that people are, people care about a lot. 
and you know the idea of the stream buffer being wide enough and that sort of thing is really really important in in um, planning and in, in zoning and design so I just wanted to to put that out there yeah and as we move on there are a number of um, sections that actually deal with that and give a whole lot of power um, in favor of protecting the environment. The question is, is it going to be enforced? Um, okay, page 75. Um, so. Okay, council. Uh, members of the council, um, my first draft language <laughs> is going to be repeated um, on, on page 75, line four where it, this is still what the director of planning does. It says, uh, among his powers and duties are to review and grant administrative exceptions for design review. And I would amend that to say, in sessions for which public notice is provided and public attendance permitted. It's the same idea. Now you can fix my language to make it clearer, yeah. but I keep, I'm going to keep repeating this tonight because. Okay. All right. All Thank right. you. And okay. then I've got another one. Okay. Before we go there, I have a question about um, and about inserting something. Um, and I don't have it in front of me, but I've talked with um, I've talked about this many times, and I've actually had this legislation introduced before and that is the creation of the Office of People's Council. Um, I believe that this would be the place to put it. Um, we have in here the Zoning Administrator, we have the BMZA, we have the Planning Commission, we have the Director of Planning, um, the Office of People's Council, which we have um, in various jurisdictions around the state to assist the public with um, zoning matters, zoning cases, uh, would this be the appropriate place to insert that? I think it would be a good place, yeah. Okay. All right, then we'll present that. Um, Mr. Wells, you think the same? Okay. Correct. All right. Then um, the hard part, sir, will be finding a place to put it in the budget. <laughs> well, if we put it in the code, then the, the budget will have to follow because the um, every major jurisdiction has the Office of People's Council for to represent our citizens. We're the only one that doesn't. Uh, it's about time we have one. If we have something on the code, does that obligate the administration to fund it? I don't think so. But yeah. It doesn't obligate them to fund it, but it obligates them to explain why they're not funding it. Okay. I, I, I ask only because, let's see, this is 2014. I passed a bill in 2008 that created a program that was supposed to operate out of the mayor's office of criminal justice and provide grants to community-based groups that were doing public safety programs and it has yet to be funded in five budgets even though it's in the it's in the code. But, but there are programs that are funded by that office right. to the community so it might not be the bill or the law that you passed but they're doing it. And that's why I'm, yeah, I, I, would, I would be happy to support an office of the People's Council, but she this is, yes, she will. Uh, I just have it in at line, uh, after line 16, and we'd have to renumber accordingly. I just had a question on that. Yes, ma'am. Again, if we include it and it isn't funded, it'll be another frustration like my colleague just said he had it passed, it was 08, and still hasn't been implemented. Passing it and not making it, a bit, uh, how would it be funded is- I think that we have- Just a, to embarrass the mayor and say, well, we wanted it, but you're not paying for well, it, I think isn't we, gonna fly. I think we have a year. I mean, we're going to be working on this for some time, so I think we have time to discuss this and make our case as to why that it should be included. We're not voting on it today, and we're discussing things that we'd like to see in it under. We want to make the best code possible, and we want to make the 
you know, um, we want to give folks the best government that we can give them. So okay, we should the law school we should, provides so wait, help. Hold on, wait a minute, let me finish. Um, so we should, you know, propose all this. We should put it all out there, discuss it all. We're going to come back and work on every single one of these amendments. And during that time, the administration's here, they've been here, they're listening to that. We're only on page 75. We got another 400 pages to go. I hear you, but I do think that we ought to find out, and I hope you do know it as an attorney, what is out there for our citizens in terms of a good representation, legal representation that wouldn't have to be a big funding uh, problem for us. Thank you. All right, um, continuing on page 75, Councilwoman Clark. Mr. Chairman, um, page 75, after line 21, uh, amendment. Uh, this, uh, this is the Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. What are his power and duties? And one, to issue use permits and I've added a new two, to supervise the zoning administrator and, and then um, two, two, two becomes three, to perform other functions assigned to him. So basically, it's just more of what I said earlier about the zoning administrator being in the housing department where he is now, keeping him or her there. I have a question with regard to um, section 3206 lines 25 to 28. Um, by including the city council with this language, could this be taken to restrict the council's ability to act in this code? Um, because if we didn't put it in there, then we would be able to act under the code wherever we felt that it was appropriate to act under the code and then someone could argue that we didn't have the powers. But here, I think it could argue that these things were being restrictive because unless there was something express plus these two. Mr. Tavala? I mean, I think for one, you have whatever the state law gives you, which is one of the amendments that we wanted to provide here. And it's an interesting, it's, an, it's, a, it's a useful comment, council member. So um, we would never, the law department wouldn't, wouldn't constrict, but somebody could, could interpret it the way you're suggesting. Mr. Willis? No, I think it deserves some additional thought, uh, the language in addition to the addition of state law. And I think um, this is pointing to some specific things and we may want to expand the language. Why don't we just delete it? Do we need to have it in there? Well, I think we're spelling out the role of the council and, and I think we can make it language, draw the language to not eliminate your I think it's important role. for the users of the code to understand that they have to get to the council for these actions specifically related to the code as people that you know use it and work with it all day we need to be able to show people very clearly that you know no matter what we say you really have to go to the council for this yep. and we need to That's clean important. this language up yeah in, in the language you're about your question about excluding you or raising a potential argument that some uh, private attorney may raise about a specific action, yeah, we need to think about that. Yeah, we, uh, we, you know, like again, we can, we can tweak the language to make sure that we're, to, because essentially you're being very direct, I mean, Councilwoman Clark's being very direct about all the places that the council is going to have authority, so we're going to have that in the code, but we can tweak this language because to get with Ms. Feinberg wants, which she wants basically just a heads up, you're going to have to be focused on, on these particular areas, but we can also add more generalized language that would, that would incorporate what you're concerned with. Ms. Floyd? The, the thing I'm looking at right now from the state code 
indicates it's 10404B, and it indicates that certain things have to be in the local zoning code in order for the Marin City Council to be able to do them. So it talks about variances and conditional uses, that they have to be in this code so that you can actually do, that you have the power given to you by the state, but you have to put it in the code that you're going to do variances and conditional uses. Yeah, I mean, it, and we have that in this code of variance, but whether or not the city council, but whether the city council does that is, 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 is an option. Well, the city's going to be doing, city council is going to be doing conditional uses. Oh, no, I, I'm, 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 I'm secure on that particular point. <laughs> Just making my, my point. But, but you also, a couple of years ago, well, more than a couple of years ago, that was put in, I think, so you, I think you all started being able to do variances along with some of your other approvals. I think that was something that came in okay. on the local level, I believe. Is it 10404B? Well, the state is 10404B that I'm looking at. Okay, we got it. Okay. All right. Councilman Henry? Um, Still on that same section. Yeah, pardon me if I uh, ramble a little bit because I'm not sure that this has all been put together in this order before. But uh, there was a conversation several months back that I was part of where um, I was trying to explain the difference between a minor amendment to a PUD and a major amendment to a PUD. And uh, the part that was confusing was that if, a, um, if, it, if something is determined to be a minor amendment, then the Planning Commission can handle it on its own. But if something is determined to be a major amendment, then it would have to come to the Council for um, a formal ordinance. If it comes to the Council for a formal ordinance, the Planning Commission still is part of that process. But if it only goes to the Planning Commission as a minor amendment, the Council is not part of that process. And the part that was difficult to explain was in a situation like that where one body is involved either way and the other body is only involved in one case, why would it be the body that's involved either way that makes the determination of whether it's minor or major? Shouldn't it be the body that may or may not be involved that determines whether or not it should or should not be involved? But there, when we were having this conversation, there was no clear mechanism discussed as to how exactly the council as the council could determine whether something was a major or a minor amendment. And then, recently, I was reminded of the process of administrative orders that transportation uses when they want to do parking restrictions that normally would require in an ordinance of the entire council, but there is a process by which they can send something through to effectively be journalized. If the council does not care to weigh in on it, then it just moves ahead as an administrative process. But if the council looks at this and says, whoa, no, this is something we need to talk about and really involve people and make part of the full legislative process, no, you can't do it by administrative order. You need to put in a bill. So I would suggest that maybe this would be a good place to spell out that the council should have that ability to make those kind of distinctions with plan unit development, the PUDs, that the council should be determining the major or minor amendment status of a suggested change to a PUD. All it says in here is that the council I'm sorry. It says to approve plan unit developments. That's what it to says. To approve plan unit developments, but in Title 13. Uh, Councilman, Title 13 is the detail on major and minor amendments, and that's where that language that you're talking about should probably should go. go. Okay. The determination would be in the PUD section, and this just says they have to rule on them. Mr. Willis. I think it goes into how you're going to rewrite 3206 to make it clear what the council authorities are, and I'm running some language through my mind about uh, in expressly saying that you have other powers under this code, well, you know, to it, not exclude it, and, and I think that would cover your point. Okay, you, if I could just you ask don't this, lose that you authority would, to do. Okay, do as that. long as you have that as a as a as a possible 
desire on our part in your head when you're crafting that language. If I could just ask the, the committee could track that when we get to, what is that, Title 13. I've got it. That that's the, that, that's the mechanism I'm going to suggest at that point for distinguishing between minor and major amendments. All right. Anybody, uh, anybody else? Or you want that same conversation? No, not. Is no, that, Mr. Chair. You Mr. Have another Chairman, amendment? I um, no, I, I just wanted to give you my amendments. Okay, we have another amendment on page seventy-five. We do. Okay. Um, page seventy-five, line twenty-seven. Now I am now in the weeds of what you're talking about. But I'd like to read you my language. You have it on your sheets. Why don't we just put it into that overall discussion of the rewrite of that? Because statute. I need to read it for it to be presented to this council. Got it. Um, that's why I insist, even when I forget to use my microphone. So I would, um, here's how I would rewrite it. Uh, powers and duties, city council, city, of the Baltimore City Council. One, to approve amendments to the zoning text and, ma and maps, and to the Baltimore City Landscape Manual. Um, second, and two, to originate and approve planned unit developments, Title 13, and to refer, and to refer them for agency reports prior to city council hearings. Got it. Uh, so they are, uh, thank you, that's been presented, it's in the mix. Okay, and that'll be incorporated into those discussions that we're having with regard to the powers. Okay, thank you. Um, anything else on page 75? Okay, page 76, title four. Page 76, um, hold on, um, hold on here. I'm on line 28, please. Okay, my Councilwoman Clark, page 76. Thank you very much. Um, new, new title, Development Reviews. Um, Page 76, amend, my first amendment in this title. Um, it is about the commit, it says the commission is to develop manual. The planning commission must develop and may revise from time to time a site plan review manual that sets forth standards and procedures for site, site plan review. So I am adding two, the manual takes effect upon commission approval submission to the Department of Legislative Reference, and posting on the city's website. That is, um, that just makes it public and everybody sees the same thing. And then I have, no, we have no objection. It's already on the city's website. There you go. And I think on, on line 30, I, well, no, that's, that, that's my, let me make sure okay. I'm doing this correctly, please. Oh, yeah, I am. Okay. Uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, it takes effect upon those things happening, yes. And then part of that amendment, if I may, finally. Sure. Three, site plan review sessions require public notice and public attendance. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, um, do we have anything else for um, Title Four, page 76? Okay, um, we're scheduled Oops. to go. Nope, 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 nope. I'm sorry. Title Four, page 76. Um, Uh, add to the site plan review, the intent is, it's our item 4-8, is to provide guidance Hold early on. in Which, the- what, Where are you? Page line, page um, line. 
under the uh, line 16 and 17. Uh, it would be a rephrasing, I guess, on line 17 to add uh, the intent is to provide guidance early in the design process for the applicant and convene an interagency review. It's under the intent of site plan review. Okay, this is uh, your 4.8. And it's, again, what page, I mean, what line was it? Uh, 1617, page 76. Is it the retention of what's there? Or uh, no, it's in addition to. Oh, okay. It probably needs some rephrasing, but. Okay. okay. On, the, um, on the blue amendment page um, that we have, um, it's number, it's 4 8 on the blue amendment page. Some of us don't have it in blue, but yeah. Okay. All right. Um, okay, we said we would go two hours. However, we've just finished Title IV and we've got about seven minutes left, but rather than start, um, I mean, we just finished Title III, and rather than start Title really get into Title IV. I just got page 76, right? If, if, if I could um, ask the chair and the committee's indulgence, uh, I, I missed a previous work session, and I wanted to know if I could just take 60 seconds to read some amendments into the record from a previous section. There's no need to discuss them tonight. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, these would be uh, text amendments to Title I, General Provisions. You have pages these on a sheet to hand to everybody. These are text amendments to Title I, General Provisions, pages 17 to 32, new definitions. On page 17, line 21, amend to add the definition cohabitators. Cohabitators are two or more unrelated persons sharing a residential unit. On page 23, line 24, under dwelling unit, we would amend the definition to read, dwelling unit would mean one or more rooms in a dwelling that one would have a maximum occupancy of one family or two cohabitators, and two would be permitted in all R districts and conditional by BMZA in all C districts. On page 32, line 21, amend to add the definition home share unit. A home share unit would allow occupancy by one family or three or more cohabitators and would be conditional by ordinance in R5 through R10 districts. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So we are, we have finished. Right. Hold on one second. Let me just get back. Um, we're going to actually conclude as of the end of page 75. The next work session on City Council Bill 120152, Transform Baltimore, will be held on Tuesday, March 11th at 11 a.m. We will begin where we ended this evening um, on page 76, line three, and that is purpose development reviews. Thank you all for attending tonight's land use and transportation committee work session. Please check the area around your seat to make certain that you have everything you brought with you. We will be closing the room shortly and ask that everyone exit promptly.